So please welcome Dr. Ryan. Well, good morning and welcome to this Summer Institute. How's everybody doing? I'm still riding high from this commencement thing we just did. That was super awesome. A great celebration of our students. And thank you, everyone, that put that together and all of you for getting our students to uh, that place in their lives. It really was uh, quite a celebration uh, for all of us. And I wanted to thank Thatcher. Where are you, Thatcher? Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's getting my thing set up. So I have a funny story about him. So maybe all of you do too. I don't know. By the way, I wanted to say, Stacy and I coordinated our outfits. What do you think? It's like that. It's the fashion line for Summer Institute. Yeah. So anyway, so Thatcher, when I moved here in, I think it was like around January 20th or January, late in January, I got off the airplane. I'd been flying all day because I came from Virginia, and that's like a 12-hour deal, right? And so I get here, and I'm going to this apartment, and I realize it's not a hotel, so I'm not going to have food. So I Google Siri and say, Siri, where's the nearest grocery store? It takes me to the Safeway. Right? So I'm in the Safeway and I'm like sorting through the avocados and a guy comes up to me with long wavy hair and a big beard and he's like, have you started your job yet? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, who are you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and why do you care? And, uh, and it was Thatcher and I don't know if it was at that moment when he said, I need you to speak at the Summer Institute. <laughs> So he's been after me I mean, since I stepped in the door, like white on rice. I mean, he was on me like, you are going to do this. And then he kept checking up on me, like, are you really going to do it? Are you going to show up? Are you going to really be here? And then I told him two days ago, he sent me an, a reminder, an email <laughs> that said, is anything that I can help to do to support you? And I said, at that point, I hadn't even started my keynote address. So it felt like pressure, like, that's her. You know, why, why did you do this to me? Uh, so, no, it's just a funny story, but thank you for inviting me. So here we are to talk about shaping mindsets. So, so there is, first of all, I wanted to say thank you all for, for uh, the, the welcome that you've given to me over the past four months and the opportunity to meet with many of you. I still have a number of staff to get to this summer, and, uh, but I had the opportunity to meet with the majority of the faculty. and. I'm learning a lot about this place, and it is an awesome place, and I'm so glad you're all here and being honest and open with me about this experience for you. Uh, because I do think that that's the way that we're gonna be able to improve the experience for ourselves and then ultimately for our students. So in thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about, I wanted to talk about shaping minds to improve student success, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart in terms of trying to close achievement gaps for individuals that uh, might not be in the majority. And so there's important research out there in the behavioral sciences that tells us that there's not only an economic and a material component to inequality, but there's also a psychological component. And the psychological component is very real and it has consequences, sometimes even devastating consequences for our students. So that's what I want to emphasize today, is that there is this psychological dimension that I'm gonna talk about to student success, and that the individual thoughts and perceptions and feelings of our students matter in a big way to their success. So what do you see here, ABC, right? Right? Is it a B or is it a 13? Okay, so the context matters, right? The context causes us to interpret the meaning of the B or the 13, and then that shapes our reality. We're both right, right? It is a B, it is a 13. But the context shapes how we understand that. And the point, and I think that's the point of psychology, generally speaking, is that there can be vastly different views from different perspectives. And so recognizing that we might see it one way and students might come to us seeing 
this environment, this learning environment, and other people in a way different from the way we see them. So this is a statue honoring a Confederate soldier. Okay, and to a lot of people that might just be a statue. But if you understand the historical context and the American legacy of the Confederate soldier and the history of racism and slavery in the United States, that could rec represent a symbol to you that you might not belong where that's located. And that's on a college campus, okay? So there's just this sense that is there because of that environment that, that, that sets people apart from the community just because of the symbol. And so you might say, well, the easy thing is to take the statue down, there's no symbol. Uh, but there's other things about our environment that create that same kind of sense of apartness, not belonging and not being part of the community or not belonging in that community. So how many of you know about Claude Steele? He's a researcher that came up with this idea around stereotype threat. So any of you that have studied, and all of you have, because you all have at least master's degrees and beyond if you're in the faculty, uh, you have kind of academic heroes, you know? Like those people that, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, they're just so awesome. Well, Claude Steele was one of those people for me. Uh, I actually had the chance to meet him in, when I was in the Aspen Presidential Fellowship. They brought him for a day. He spent the day with 40 of us speaking to us, and then he did small group presentations with us and Q&A, and it was just like a hero moment, you know, like I was like academic crush, right, on this guy. So he wrote about stereotype threat, and, he did, and this is a, a study that's been replicated over and over and over, but it was the whole idea that you know, women who are in classes with men perform less well on math when men are in the room as opposed to when they're not, and that there's this threat that's in the air, it's invisible, but it causes an individual to have a vigilance about them that sucks their energy. It siphons some energy away from their being able to give 100% to the task that's there. And so how can we turn off that vigilance for people that feel apart or feel like they don't belong to the whole, right? So that's my point, that there's psychological nudges that we can give our students to lessen that vigilance. And so when I was in conversation with Claude Steele, I was trying to understand this. What do you mean, vigilance? Like there's, you know, there's just energy that they're worried about not belonging. They're worried that they're apart from the group. They're spending mental energy so they can't give 100% to learning, right? And so he described it this way. This is the snake. He said, it's, he says, Lisa, it's like this. You're at your house, and you're sitting in your living room, and you see a snake roll across your floor. You're not going to sleep until that snake is out of that house, right? It's that, that's the vigilance. You're, like, you're not going to be able to eat dinner. You're not going to be able to do what you need to do until that snake is out of that house. And I got it then. So isn't that a great analogy? So like you're... You're, you're, you can do your tasks, you can try to take a class, you can try to learn, you can try to take a test, but you're, this vigilance is there because you're worried about that snake. And so how do we turn off the vigilance? How do we lessen, remove the snake so that students can learn and give 100% to the task of learning? So that's the point of my presentation. So I'm done now. <laughs> so. So this is the basic behavioral model, and I think we would all agree that behavior drives results. Anybody disagree with that? We can change behavior, we can change results, right? Well, there's a mindset model that says, don't waste your time trying to change behavior, you gotta start with the mindset. The mindset change will then have the behavior follow. So the mindset, mindset informs which behaviors the person chooses and the effectiveness of those behaviors. So it's this concept of focus on mindset, not trying to move the behaviors. But most people, without giving thought to the mindset, are just trying to push behavioral change by changing target behaviors. 
And what happens in that instance is that you're going to run into resistance uh, and you're not going to be able to meet your target results in the way that you think you are. And so starting with the mindset is critically important. So they suggest that leading with the mindset and then the behaviors follow. So how can we remove the snake by impacting the mindset of our students with little psychological nudges, okay? So have any of you read the book Nudge? You ever heard of it? Okay, so it's a really, really good read. And so it talks about little things that we can do in the environment that will change people's behavior and make them do the right thing without having to actually tell them to do it. Okay, so there's things that we can do that can influence and nudge a student to do the right things, right? And so this originated in an Amsterdam airport, this, the concept of this. He uses this as what, the prime example of a nudge. There were, in the Amsterdam airport, there was a uh, custodial manager who was having problems with urinal spillage, okay? <laughs> so I am a mother of two boys and a husband, and my dog's even a male, and so I know all about urinal spillage. <laughs> So they, the, the custodial manager was like, you know, this is crazy. I'm spending all this time cleaning up the floor. There's just, you know, how do you get individuals to, to pay attention to this? And so what he did is he etched a fly. <laughs> this is true. He etched a fly. There it is. It's not real, but it looks real, doesn't it? So he put a little fly on there. And lo and behold, 80% improvement <laughs> in urinal spillage. So my house has flies. No, I'm kidding. So, but, but right? And then he, he was able to estimate that that was an 8% improvement in the cost of cleaning because of, uh, of less spillage. Is Clint in the room? <laughs> we got to tell Clint Ewell and get some flies going on, right, right, 8%, that's the money, right? So anyway, uh, so that's the, the example of a nudge, right? I mean, we didn't tell them to do anything differently. It was just a little change in the environment that allowed them to do the right thing and helped improve the environment for all of us. So I, I love that example. So uh, my point in, in this presentation is that psychology can be marshaled for educational gain. We can tweak the way students perceive their social world for educational gain. And that there are brief social interactions that can happen that can have not only significant effects, but long lasting effects on students. And so um, while I'm not gonna prescribe what those things will be, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research there. Again, this is the psychological nudge which in the research is especially significant for those that are in marginalized groups, okay? Could be our first generation students, could be our students of color, could be women, could be any group that doesn't feel like they're in the majority or feel like they don't belong. So it's this idea that the psychological nudge will, will lead with the mindset and then the behaviors will follow. So uh, this was a, a, a study uh, called the Wise Feedback Study. And so what they did is they took a control group and an experimental group, and when the teacher marked up the paper in red, as teachers may do, they also included a personal note in, hand, in the teacher's handwriting to the student. And the first one said, I'm giving you these comments so that you have feedback on your essay. Please revise, okay? So that was the teacher's, teacher's note for the control group. And then the experimental group said, I'm giving you these comments because I have high standards and I know that you can meet them. Okay? So it's not because, you, you have all these red marks because I have high standards, not because you did something wrong, right? I have high standards and I believe in you that you can meet them, right? So just a little tweak, right? And so here's what happened. In terms of the percentage of students revising their essay, in the white control group, 
revise their essay. With the intervention, higher number, right? Pretty significant, 87%. African-American students in the control group, only 17% revised their essay. But look how many with the intervention, right? So that's the nudge that took away that this was about me, I'm not doing well. They took the snake out of the room, right? And allowed that student to think, oh, wow, the teacher thinks I can do this. And this isn't about me, it's about the high standards of the teacher. Right? So, and also the scores on the revised essay. The white control group went from 11.25 to a 12 to 1, and then the 9.45 to 11.91. So, while not completely beginning to close that, that achievement gap, right? So, just I think that's my favorite study ever. I love that. But they've replicated this over and over with different groups, and it's, and it's a long, there's long lasting effects with this one too. And so, I write that. Yeah, so they followed the students for two years after this happened, and they found that the African American students had 30% advancement overall in academic performance, which virtually closed the achievement gap for them overall, not just in this one assignment. So it's a, that's the, um, some evidence that long-lasting effects can happen by small tweaks or nudges. Uh, this is the belonging in college study. Uh, they took college freshmen and they told them, we want to understand the freshman experience. And we want to understand it so that we can help the freshmen that are following you. So in that way, they weren't stigmatizing the students that they needed to know this. They were becoming the benefactor, not the ben beneficiary of this intervention in their minds. And what they did is they said, we want you to read through these comments of some older students uh, and then give us some comments on your experience that can help uh, incoming students. So they read the comments of the older students. After winter break, I realized that all of my good friends were at home. I didn't have friends like that at school. I got involved in extracurricular opportunities. I met people with common interests. It took time before I found a niche. There were times when I felt lonely, okay? Another one, I worried that I was different from other students. Now it seems ironic. Everybody feels they're different freshman year from everybody else, uh, when really, in at least some ways, we're all pretty similar. And so the point of this was that they were uh, setting the expectation that difficulty in college and these feelings that you're having about apartness are common. They're commonplace. And, and all students feel some level of that when transitioning into a new environment, particularly a, a more difficult learning environment, uh, and that it's short-lived. Okay, so the whole message in this exercise was to, to show them that this apartness they may be feeling may not be attributed to them, but attributed to the environment. It's commonplace and it's short-lived. So what they found, again, the impact was more significant on the marginalized groups, more resilience in minority groups when looking at social experiences at college. The students were more likely to put themselves out there, meaning seek help for two, from professors, ask questions in class, put themselves out and engage more. And then four years later, they had higher GPAs in the treatment condition than the control group. And it almost halved the achievement gap overall in their GPAs. So something pretty simple, but normalizing the difficulty. Um, I remember when my, uh, my husband's a math teacher, thank God, and, and my kids were in math classes and struggling uh, in middle school. And I remember uh, my husband having a conversation with them that nobody's born and wakes up you know, one day and knows how to do math. It's like, it's difficult, it's a puzzle. You know, you gotta figure it out and put effort and energy into it. Nobody just looks at a problem and can do it. And it was like a light bulb went off for them that, that oh, oh, you know, I'm putting in all this effort and energy and that's normal, right? <laughs> and other people, there's just this assumption that people can just do math. Well, no, they're putting in effort and energy to do math well and sticking with the problem until it's solved. So 
uh, having the achievement gap again, just showing students that uh, what they're feeling really is part of the normal college transition and not necessarily about them or the group that they're in. This was an, a third study on values affirmation and it was done in middle schoolers and then they followed them into college. And they asked them, this is the exercise, they asked them to identify a few things that were important to them, to think about times when, they, when these things were important to them and to write a few sentences describing that and not to worry about their uh, grammar, punctuation, all that, but just to really try to get their thoughts and feelings down. Some of the excerpts said, my friends and family are most important to me. I have a different, if I have a difficult situation, my friends give me companionship and courage. My family gives me love and understanding. Uh, another talked about independence. It's important to me because your parents won't always be there to baby you. You have to live your life. If I didn't have my religion, I didn't know what I would do. I would be lost. And I thought this was interesting. Athletic ability is useful. In 9-11, those people had to run down the stairs with some skill. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, so then they followed these students uh, that had been in this affirmation process compared to the control group into college. And they found seven years later, uh, in both conditions, the white students in both conditions, 63% of them enrolled. In the control group, 47 African American, and the affirmation study, 67% of them enrolled in college from that affirmation study. Uh, and then the highly competitive schools, that number went from 11% to 29% for African Americans. So just a sense that uh, there's a connection and a value um, that they can rely on as they work through and to reduce, again, that vigilance that they feel, may feel. Uh, this is Nancy Schlossenberg. Is everybody familiar with Nancy? She was a, she's an emerita faculty at uh, Maryland. And she talked about m mattering and, and this idea of mattering versus marginality. And she did a, a a phenomenal, uh, I never can say that word, phenomenological, phenomenological, say that three times fast, uh, study where she, she looked at this difference between uh, how, how students experience an environment when they matter, feel like they matter, or when they feel like they're marginalized. And in the mattering, she talks about others are interested in what happened to me, happens to me, they empathize with me, they appreciate me. And in the mar marginalized environment, I feel like I don't belong to the group. I feel unnoticed, ignored, unrecognized, and disconnected from others. That, that air of apartness that we were talking about. And six themes emerged from her study around mat mattering and marginality. And she talks about them as praise in classrooms, the professor's words and the written feedback that they provide, from community mentors and peers, and that they perceived that they mattered when the professor simply acknowledged them through comments on notes, or noticed when they were absent, right? So when a student is absent, to say, we missed you in class last week, or to send them an email and say, we missed you in class. I mean, just to acknowledge that I, I, I'm missed, right? That I'm part of this community and, and, and they missed me, it matters. Uh, they say, a quote, anytime I get praise in class, I realize they're taking notice of me. I must be doing something good, I must matter. Uh, as opposed to the unseen. Uh, they've experienced marginalization when feeling insignificant or invisible, uncomfortable asking questions, no collection to the, uh, connection to the class or the instructor, and when they didn't acknowledge their presence or it, their absence, right? So just, uh, considering how we might set the environment in the classroom and outside uh, that makes students know that they matter and that they belong here. She talks about faculty and staff being invested in me. I believe that I'm a value to others, that relationships are important. I felt valued when others invested in my success and spending time, energy with me. She makes me believe that she really cared about me as a person. As opposed to feeling um, like they're a nuisance. And I, I love this quote. 
hurry up and ask your question. I got to get moving to the next thing, right? So this idea, I talked to you about that lecture already. You know, they acted like they were in a big hurry. They didn't have time for me. And so that's an interesting dichotomy between investing in me versus, versus making me feel insignificant. In this one, she talks about sense of community. When I joined the student government, I felt like I was part of something bigger. I felt like I mattered. Um, I think this one points to the importance of engagement outside the classroom and the ability to form uh, social relationships that uh, provide some of the formative learning that allows students to engage fully in the formal learning that takes place in the classroom versus the outsider. Students that experience marginalization when they did not fit with the surrounding. And then first year students reporting having perceptions of not fitting in when first coming to campus, not being prepared for the competitive learning environment. So letting students know that they, they indeed belong here. Yes, it's gonna be difficult, that's common. Happens with everybody, stay the course, you've got this, right? Uh, Terrell Strayhorn, he used to be at Ohio State University. Um, there was kind of a controversial removal from Ohio State University um, that you might want to Google. Uh, but then he, uh, now he's at Lemoyne, but I, I, I met with him uh, and we talked about bringing him to our campus in Virginia. We never got to that point because of his disruption at Ohio State. Uh, but he was one that talked a lot about uh, creating environments that communicate that students matter, that people care about them, that I'm worthy, that we're alike enough to celebrate difference, and that difference doesn't equal deficient. And uh, he said, success depends on the extent to which we can create environments where students fit and they belong. And I've seen him on, there's YouTube videos of him presenting, and he will say this in his classes, you know, and he'll say it when he does his presentations to groups. Say it loud, I matter. And people say, I matter, right? And, and he has them actually recite, I'm enough. I'm here on purpose. I belong here. And just telling ourselves that and believing it and having our teachers tell us that and having our staff tell us that uh, can make a significant difference. So the psych this is a, the, the, the wrap-up. So the social and psychological research tells us that once students have opportunity and access to education, which they do here, thank goodness at Yavapai College, that it's the nudges and feelings of belonging and adequacy that actually leads to their success. Uh, Sandy Shugart is the president of Valencia College, and he was one of the mentors in my uh, Aspen Presidential Fellowship again. And he, I love this quote that he had, uh, shared with us, the college is what the students experience. It's how they experience us that counts, not how we experience them. And I think you all read, didn't you all read the, the, um, the Student Ready College as, as a common read? No? No? Why did I think that? So it is that point. You know, it's not about are the students ready, are the students college ready, it's is the college student ready, right? Are we ready for them? You know, do we understand how they experience us? And how might we tweak that environment just a little bit so that they experience us in a way that gets rid of the snake, right? Before anything else, we need to know we matter. And what may seem psychologically small can actually be big and significant and have lasting impact on our students' self-perception and their educational success. So I hope I had uh, made you think a little bit about some things that we might do um, in eradicating snakes <laughs> <laughs> from our homes and from our classroom and from our college environment. And I'll take any questions that you might have about just about anything, this or the college. Thank you. Any questions? Any, que any questions? Any comments? I actually have some comments. Okay. So I, I enjoyed the presentation and I like where you're going with 
um, looking at the organizational health of the institution. Mm -hmm. I know we've talked about the organizational health. We've been meeting with people. Yeah. And I think these are clues of how we want to move forward in improving that organizational health with what we can do to interact with our students, what we can do to interact with each other, what we can do to you know sort of bridge you know whatever whatever may have happened in the past. And so I think um, by providing these nudges, by um, you know, working with our students and really letting people know that we value them and what they do, if we can just change that mindset a little bit, then I think, you know, we'll, the whole culture will begin to shift a little. So yeah. I'm, I'm getting that, that, that's sort of the direction we might want to look to as we improve our organizational health. Look at you. <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, so in my communique with you, I talked a little bit about this idea of adopting an outward mindset. And there's a, there's a natural inclination and normal inclination for individuals to have an inward mindset. It's a self-preserving kind of thing, and it's just the natural way of, of acting. Uh, so for example, if I'm working on a project and Ron Liss is over here, and Clint Yule's over here, and Rodney Jenkins is over here, I'm thinking, what do I need from them in order to move my project forward? How can they help me achieve this goal? Rather than thinking, what are the challenges and needs of Ron and Rodney and Clint, and how can we collectively achieve a goal together? Right? So it's, it's a shift in thinking about uh, and asking uh, for input and questions and voice for various groups before we decide, right? And it's going to be important uh, and for us to kind of move uh, slowly uh, but consistently in making that kind of shift to ensuring that we're looking at outward before we move forward on projects or important decisions so that we see the challenges and see the concerns and see the good ideas and the input from the others that collectively will allow us to work together more effectively and efficiently. And so uh, initially uh, in trying to determine where we were going to go as an institution, you know, it wasn't it's not in my nature to come up with a number of activities. Oh, we're going to do A, B, and C. Uh, you know, I was looking to what is the, what's going on with this organization? What have I learned in the last four months? What are the themes that are emerging? And how can we be the strongest possible organization as we move into our planning phases? Uh, and I felt like it would, I would be remiss as your president if we just started to jump into planning in the fall. We have some work to do in how we interact and interrelate and to get the health of our organization and our own relationship excellence in place so that we can execute at the highest levels when we begin our planning. And so it, it was important, it's, it is important to me that we get the foundation right and that we have the strongest possible organization as we move into the development of our academic plan and our next str strategic plan. And, and I say that because I'm, I'm not interested in uh, ticking off a couple of activities and being gone in three years. I plan to be here for the long term. And I, the health of the organization is necessary for us to be healthier in the long term. And if we miss that piece, uh, I think we would pay for it in 10 years. So. Uh, that's where we're going, but you got it. All right, questions. Tina Lockman. I just wanted to say I appreciate your presentation, and um, a lot of us at this college have taught student success skills classes over the years. Very one credit hour, three credit hour version. And a lot of this that you shared today really rings true with what that class tries to do for students. So perhaps that's something that you might consider, you know, expanding what we do with those type of classes. But also like for the entire college to have that culture 
helping students feel like they belong and that they matter. So I appreciate it. Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much. I just like to thank you for the warm because my presentation is on how to get Zoom and involved. In the <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. I really appreciated the specific examples because a lot of times we'll hear about well, student success and this is what you need to do without translating it into the actual. Like just using that, well, I have high standards, and that's why I'm totally using that. And yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and it'd be I want more of that. I want more, like really, I, I guess it's just the way my brain works. The concrete, specific examples, what can you do really easy, quick nudges that will, that seem to have enormous effects. So, Suki, it's interesting that you say that. So. It, it, at my last place, I, I began to have conversations like this, and we committed, uh, the faculty decided we wanted to create what we call a culture of care for students. Uh, that is this, like, they matter, they belong, and, and how can we do this? And so I actually collected ideas from faculty, and we put together, like, a compendium of, of nudges. And so if you're interested in doing that, we could certainly do that here and just share your ideas on little things that you do um, that other people could modify or adopt. And if you're interested in doing that, we'd be happy, I'd be happy to figure out how we can make that happen. Others interested in that? Okay. Oh, interesting, yeah. Lisa said she'd like to see this apply in the workplace environment as well. Okay. Additional questions, comments, staff? Thank you so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rice, for sharing these ideas. I, it really, um, it really uh, hits home for me as um, having been in the student development background for a long time. Just as a now working in veterans upward bound as uh, in an instructional program for kind of a, a group that feels marginalized yeah. in many ways on campus uh, or in this college environment. I think these, these little nudges are really going to be something that we continue to draw from. We do it a little bit, but it's nice to have a name for it. You know, yeah. Have, um, Call it out, right? You're welcome. I think it's, it's helpful to call it out, to, to name it, and then to try to get the masses to, to adopt it, right? Questions, comments? Here's your chance. All right. <laughs> changing mindset, it, you have to have self-awareness in the practice of mindfulness. And I don't know if those two elements are innate all the time mm. with everybody or uh, a natural practice. And I think incorporating workshops or you know, things that might be consistent throughout the year to help staff, because this can be a trickling effect um, if staff are incorporating that in their everyday lives. I think it would just eventually start to come down in that slow, gradual process that you talked about. Um, and also, too, I think in relevancy, it's not just about education and how it affects your students. This is your life. I mean, I think I see this impacting everyone's life in a very positive manner. So I don't think it would hurt to kind of have more practice around those two things to help us be more successful in executing them. I totally agree. This is about your relationships with your family, your relationships with your friends. I mean, application in many, many parts of our lives. And, and we are working. Um, Emily, where's Emily? Uh, 
has engaged with the executive leadership team. I've asked her actually to, to join us as part of the executive leadership team because of the immense work we're going to be doing around the organizational health and that she has the training aspect uh, in part in her area. And so she's gonna help uh, engage with the leadership team to, to prepare us all. So I thank you for your comments. I don't have a question, just a real quick comment. Um, where, where, oh, you're here. I'm like, where is it? <laughs> but I listen to podcasts a lot, and one of my favorites is Ted Radio Hour. So if you want just a real quick hitter on exactly what Dr. Ryan talked about today, there's one called Nudge. And um, the person that wrote the book, Nudge, uh, he featured her, Carol Dweck featured in the, in its uh, Ted Radio Hour um, talk. So it's a great podcast. So if you're interested in learning more and want just a 45-minute quick hitter, it's, it's awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Okay. Are we good? Thank you again for this opportunity. Enjoy your day.